everyone. Welcome back to the world. ST Van and Sassy Samik. My name is Pavlam Hatia, and right now we're on our fireside chat on zero trust framework and requirements ad hoc for ST Van. Well, we're joined for this fireside chat. First up, we have David Wang, the Regional Information Security Manager, ASEAN, NS Blue Scope, Singapore. Well, David has over a decade of experience in cybersecurity field across several industries and has experience in building and maintaining information security program. He's somebody who's graduated with a master's in information security from Royal Holloway. Thank you so much, David, for joining us today. Thanks so much for the introduction. Thank you. And joining David is Sharmen Balmont, the VP IT Security and IT Infrastructure, Aboitis Group, Philippines. Well, Charmaine is a certified cybersecurity professional with 30 plus years of experience in the US military and the private sector. She's experienced in building cyber risk and IT security programs with highly effective teams focused on reducing the risk of security breach, minimizing disruptions to preserve the brand reputation and build client confidence. Thank you so much, Charmaine, for joining us today and giving us your valuable time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, with this, I now leave the stage to David and Charmaine to take it forth with their fireside chat. Over to you. Sure. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so, morning to you, Charmaine. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, David. And hi, um, everyone. Um, so, so glad to be here and, and in this uh, fireside. <coughs> so, I think um, earlier discussion talked about outlining possible pathway for SD WAN evolution, right? So, we talked about SD WAN and it provides big benefits to uh, as compared to the traditional WAN connection between data centers and remote connections. Um, now, cybersecurity, information security, bridges, incidents are all the common words that we hear right now, right? So, so in the particular for SD-WAN, uh, zero trust come into the picture, right? So I think my first question to Shamin is, uh, what is zero trust, right, altogether? And how does zero trust fits into SD-WAN as well as uh, from a holistic picture, how does zero trust fit into the orchestration of SASIM? Maybe you want to share some insights on that, Shami? All right. Um, the bottom line to zero trust, just that, right? And SASE solutions are the ability or the technology that allow you to provide that zero trust. And zero trust is stick access regardless of location and regardless of the equipment you're on. So you're basically saying that um, wherever I am with my laptop or my mobile device accessing, accessing a system, any part of the world, I should be able to be secured in it, right? Um, the line and everything. And it's assured that it's me based on my role and my privileges to a specific application. And that's zero trust where it's basically saying no ID, no entry. Right? And the security mm. guard at the mall says you can't get in because you don't have the identification mm. and you don't have the badge to work here. It's that message on the cloud infrastructure or where for that matter. Yeah, um, that's that's a good point, Shamin. So uh, that's zero trust. So let's go deeper into the discussion about zero trust fitting into SD-WAN and the orchestration of SASE. So how does that work all together, right? Right. The first thing that we need to identify is um, we are preconditioned to looking for a tool to provide service, right? But we need to understand user experience or the user, how will they connect to their application? What is that use case? Hmm. So we change our perspective from building the fort and building the castles, the molten castle theory. Um, previously, we said we need multi-factor authentication. All right, I'm going to go get this service, put it on, on my security architecture, and there, everybody can just utilize it. That is no longer the case today. We need to change that perspective because we are no longer in that corporate environment. Um, so that's the first thing we need to identify, right? Um, and realize it's a paradigm shift, yep. right? Um, you look at it from a point of view of a user accessing their application and system. And that's how you build the security around it. And um, previously, again, we used to be different. We'll take the, the solution. And that's how we ended up with this, I guess, a plethora of 
uh, security solutions that we are trying to figure out how they connect, the Legos that don't necessarily fit well together. And so that's that's the baseline I, I, I'd like to think of in that sense, right? Yep. How about the how about in terms of the orchestration into uh SASE, right? Um, because I think that there has been a lot of offensive emphasis over the past two, three years. So how does that uh, uh put into the picture? Because um when we move, when we talk about zero trust and security by design, right? You just rightly mentioned about the way that we do things previously is security is always at the last stop, right? Always as at the last mile. But right now we are moving this shift to security by left, security by design, right? So and what when do security come into the picture in the orchestration of SASI? Right. I think that's that's an interesting uh, conversation that uh audience may may want to know, you know. Um, very you, true. Yeah. And very true. And this is what we experience today. We're all learning this new, there's new, this new shift, this new way of thinking. And we need to be prepared to implement, right? And to implement that, besides understanding everything. Um, how many applications, services, endpoints, infrastructure, and users you have in your environment, right? It's the concept of what do I have before I put together and build the house, right? Um, what do I have in place? In most cases, you have a lot of infrastructure related and you've got a lot, maybe a few on cloud. Um, and even those that have been born and raised in the cloud environment for new organizations, too must think outside of that sense because there's um, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. And remember that when you get a service online, mm. software as a service per se, the only thing that's really important at that point is access, right? If you yeah. have that access and credentials, but the transmission of that is not necessarily secure, mm. right? Mm. Um, or if it is, it is of the basic kind. So we're building those, and we know we do know that there are many um, few services, security services, have consolidated their um, services together to provide us that secure access service edge, or pushing security to the edge, right? Where a lot of those things that we point solutions that we have had that we have on the enterprise is now moving to those um, consolidated services. The yes. key right there is understanding how you migrate. If you're going to migrate from infra to cloud and using SaaS solutions, what is the data mapping? Where is your data? How is it secured? And how do you move your users? And you, we may find that there may be different variations of this process. And we need to accept the fact that it's not a point solution or one gate that they're all going to go through. It's not going to happen. Or the single pane of glass. Many have said that, that, and I'm sure a lot of vendors will say that as well, that we have developed at least two panes of glass, right? But never the one, right? Because there's not one single. And orchestrating those things are going to be tricky if we don't understand the data flow and the user experience. Yeah, and I, and, and I echo that, Charmaine, because I, I came across some um, projects where they just do a fork lift, you know, typically from an on-prem and straight out to the SaaS and it fail, you know, a fail big time, right? So I think um, understand why it's business case, data flow, they are all essential as part of this whole journey, right? Whether you are talking about integration with SASE, you're talking about deploying SD-WAN, you know, given the situation right now, you know, um, in, in pandemic and people working from home, right? Now, let's, let's jump into question two, right? Uh, now that we know uh, what is SD-WAN, how does that, or rather, what, what is Zero Trust? How does Zero Trust fit into SD-WAN? How does that integrate with the orchestration onto SASE? Let's go into the second question. And, and I think um, given that uh, the pandemic situation right now, the COVID situation, right? Everyone is just connecting from anywhere and everywhere, right? Uh, countries, some countries are opening up, some are still in lockdown mode, but nevertheless, many are still working from home and they are off the premise. All right. Now, my question to you is what are the challenges in achieving zero trust in the context of SD WAN? Right. 
Now, there's two ends of the spectrum. One end is you are a service provider. You have a different set of challenges. The other end of the spectrum is I'm coming from an enterprise environment. I'm an end user, all right? How does that work, right? Because both have the same situation, but they both have different needs and different sets of challenges. So maybe we start off by talking about challenges from a service provider standpoint. Right. Challenges from a service provider standpoint is understanding your client's requirements. Yep. Right. Number one. Um, and it's not just understanding they have X amount of people, number, assets and the like, but it's understanding how they currently connect and the way by which they need. Right. Again, the migration schedule, the migration in, um, uh, uh, procedures will vary. And I, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, it wasn't like a pickup, exactly what you said, lift and shift. I lift and shift. I take what I have on, on premise and put it on cloud. It's Night, that's a nightmare, right? <laughs> and it's, and when you think about it, um, and I've experienced that, um, infrastructure, the, the IT infrastructure, no, they're going to put it. Yes. Availability wise. Yes. But security wise, it has changed tremendously. Right. Um, especially if it's not IS, right? If they're saying, oh, I'm taking this service and it's going to be a SaaS or a pass. Those are two different sets of security responsibilities between client and service provider. So as a service provider, if I were to put myself in service shoes, I need to understand how the client, understand how they operate. Meaning let's go through that diagram. Let's go through that process flow. And exactly look at how they're going to migrate. Do they have access control matrices? Mm. Because that's what's going to tell you who needs access, who needs multi-factor, right? Yep. In some cases, depending on the data they're using, they may not, or they may have legacy. And that's the other piece. Not mm. everybody is ready for that lift and shift. And they find out when they lift and, and shift it to the cloud provider. Um, and multi-factor is as difficult, right? Making that a prerequisite as well. In some cases, some organizations still don't have multi-factor. So that's yet something you need to contend with before moving into SDN and prep it. We gotta prep that architecture for them to move into. And there are certain things that we need to consider before they do. Access control, multi-factor authentication, privilege access management. If those processes are not there, you will have a difficult time um, implementing that in the new technology because the processes themselves are the base, right? Um, you won't have anything to put onto the <laughs> into the SaaS safe frame if I'm going to orchestrate and say, I need to put security controls or policies. Absolutely. I don't have a base to go by if I don't have those processes written down. Yeah. And I echo that statement about um, different processes when we talk about from a service provider standpoint is having um, that understanding and experience and a journey with different business verticals. Because if you are in a particular industry, let's say manufacturing, right? And a financial industry is totally two different sets of processes. But I think what service provider can do is having a common set of processes for that business vertical. All right. They learn through battle scars. They learn through a lot of lesson learned with, with their customer journey. You know, build that as a lesson learning case for that particular uh, business segment and they move on. I think that, that can really value add from a service provider perspective. Yeah. So what about the other end of the spectrum, Shamin? What, what, what's your thoughts? Um, if you are an enterprise customer, you know, definitely you hope that uh, you have someone that listens to you, you know, walk through the journey with you. Or, you know, at, at some point, experience the type of better scars, right? So uh, what, what are your guidance on this? You know, if I'm a customer right now from an enterprise, I want to onboard to SD1, I want to onboard to SASE, you know, but I'm scared about security, all right? And after going through this session about zero trust, I'm more afraid, right? So any guidance for that? It's the same, it's the same preparations I would have had asked had I been a service provider and as a client consuming these services. Um, lessons learned, things that we're learning on the, on the ground now is um, that, that lift and shift method, methodology, right? And knowing what the data, it used to be, 
okay, I'm going to go ahead and think about my critical data first, right? I'm securing, this is an old adage, um, although it's not, not to say that it's not real today either or um, applicable. The first thing is understanding where toxic data is. I call toxic data and we call toxic data if it's classified or sensitive information. But at the same time, it's what do most, what is mostly widely used? That's the other end of it, mm. right? Because the entry points, we're really just talking about, okay, the end state is they're getting my critical data. But really, you also need to look at what is widely used by your users. So realizing, wow, wait a minute, it's those productivity tools that they're all using day in and day out. Maybe, you know, and finding the clear um, delineation, right? So you're actually preparing the, the, the environment. I need to make sure I know exactly what are those systems and applications. I got to have the data flow because when I talk to the support service provider, he's yeah. going to need that information. And we don't want to do that once the contract has been signed and they're ready to implement. So time, time is also another key in saying that we need that um, plan for, you need to plan for the implementation. I think in this day and age, we, it's fast, you know, we, we are going at a fast pace. So let's not forget to put in that time to prepare for an implementation. Sure. I think that's, that's really, uh, uh, in terms of uh, insight, that's really valuable. Now, um, let's move into a third question to find out, and, and that's for me, right? Um, is there any uh, framework or guidance about zero trust? I mean, not particularly about uh, certain technologies, but if me as an InfoSec professional from the enterprise environment, all right, if I want to go into zero trust, is there any particular framework or, you know, uh, guidance out there that I can work along with uh, in conjunction with my service provider, my MSSP, or even my security vendors that would be part of this whole uh, SD1 implementation, right? <clears throat> One of the key key points I always allude to, I always go back to, and uh, it's like ready reference and bookmarked in my, on my sheet is um, an NISD, the NIST standards. And they will have a reference guideline for everything you can ever think of. And luckily, NIST Special Publication 800-207 is a good reference guide. Mm -hmm. But the whole tenet, everything about cyber is in the NIST, right? Um, and they've now moved to other areas as well. But um, I use it as a baseline because I found and in experience I found that it's been used as a baseline for building other things like the cybersecurity maturity model, yep. right? Um, so we go back to that and NIST and SANS and that's not um, the attack frame, the MITRE attack framework. Those are three areas that we, I, I really go back into. Um, and if you were to ask me, what's your Bible? I'll go back to NIST, right? Um, because it's, it's there that it gives you the basic premise at that level that's um, applicable to any industry and being that I'm from the military so I, I, I understand that anything short of the security standards of the military in the private sector is always a good thing um, because that's the first tenet of, of security right confidentiality um, the differences are um, that we need to understand is if we are or we are servicing operational technology operations technology um, they do have NIST, but there is NERC, right? Um, but they also utilize a different type. It all kind of boils together, but we got to make sure that in operations technology, it's about availability, right? Um, so impute security is carefully done in an operations technology environment. And more so today because, you know, we've got IOTs. Imagine zero trust with IOTs. This is something I'm looking into now, mm. right? Mm. I know, we know, we know that IOTs are part of our environment um, and will be part of an SD-WAN, will be part of um, uh, an architecture. And we need to look into those as well and how they fit into the picture. 
Yeah, that's that's really great point because when we talk about SD WAN, actually the platform and the exposure is just going to be so wide, right? IoT come into the picture. And to add on to that, when we talk about OT, we still have that manufacturing uh, digital journey, right? You know, many companies are moving their manufacturing, their OT space into digital strategy, right? That's part of the whole digital strategy and transformation. So um, that will be a big shift in terms of how uh, OT works and the manufacturing 4.0 moving forward. So I think um, that's really a great point, um, Charming. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and I think that, that cyber framework actually forms up as a form of a guardrails. You know, um, baseline is, is definitely will be good. Um, and, and I share that comment with you. But for companies that may have a different focus in terms of business, I think that can also serve as a guardrails to where they want to go in terms of their business needs. Now, um, we are just down to the last five minutes, uh, Shamin. Um, any key takeaways or, or you know, for the audience that uh, any specific point you think that would be valuable or if there's any one single takeaway in the context of zero trust for SD-WAN, what would that be? I think for the most part, I keep this in mind all the time. And I, even I remind myself, I actually have a sticky on my, on my monitor that says that, you know, work from, work from everywhere, work from anywhere securely. Right? Um, that in itself, as I talk to people and I do things every day in a day, starting to look at the architecture. Um, we need to simplify this, this conundrum we've built with security technology, right? Uh, yeah. If you look at your security architecture on premise, gosh, you've got firewalls, you've got um, network, IDS, IPS, you name it, and we bought a point solution for that. And then, although that's quite secure, I would say, no, as we've built that over time, We've got to do that same mentality when we're in the cloud and the way to do it is with SASE. Um, but always remember at each project, the business is thinking about because that's who we, our customers are, is can that user connect securely wherever they may be? Yeah. And is that service provider secure and able to in the same way? Because you're connecting two things, your user and the service provider. And that's where, um, in some cases, for the user, it's just okay because it's a controlled environment. But the, control, the service provider, incorporating them into that SaaS framework is also uh, another key that we need to think about. Yeah, definitely. I, I, and, and I guess um, there will be a lot of lesson learned and that journey is not going to be that straightforward, you know, regardless of any right. business verticals that you are in. You know, I myself coming from a previous uh, service provider background and I think, um, it's definitely good to have that insight, but to walk through that journey together, I think um, a large part goes into the awareness to the organization. You know, understanding is not that uh, fault leap type of approach like we just mentioned and we have just discussed, right? So I think um, we are ahead of time and we are three minutes ahead of time, but um, I guess we have, it was a good conversation. We covered almost everything. Um, so uh, just, uh, close off today's um, discussion on zero trust for SD-WAN. Um, I guess, first, first of all, to, is to understand about what are the devices coming in, right? And authentication play a large part in terms of SD-WAN. Second is to understand what is a risk exposure when you integrate into SASE, right? If I may just wrap it up in the, in the form of a risk assessment approach, right? Have a good risk assessment regardless of where you are, what type of exposure, do a proper risk assessment, all right? Then, uh, we, we go into the second question about the challenges that we have, and you have rightly mentioned about the challenges, right? And also, I think uh, the key takeaway, and I and I will definitely bring it and put it close to my heart, Shami, is security is everywhere, right? Especially we talk into uh, uh, what is required moving forward um, for zero trust, right? As the went and beyond, right? So uh, with that, uh, Shami, if there's nothing else from you, um, I'm happy to close off um, the fireside chat and pass the time back to uh, Bhavana. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. What a wonderful fireside chat that was with Charmaine. Thank you both of you for joining you. us and being a part of our inaugural edition of the World ST Van and Sasky Summit. Thank you once again. Thank you.